So can I use this? Very good. Um, it's quite a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I realize it's the end of a long day, the end of a long week. Um, I will try to make this talk uh, from 20,000 feet instead of um, uh, mathematically precise. Uh, so I hope you will stay awake for it, but I'll understand if you don't. I've had my own troubles. Um, <clears throat> I do want to begin by thanking Professor Okanoya for an incredible, incredible session here. And um, uh, hearing all of the talks that have preceded, um, it makes my talk in inter ending this session uh, quite a daunting task. Uh, but I'll try to give you uh, what I think is a different kind of takeaway, and that is what I want to do is to open up the box. Uh, basically, to make sure that we are talking about all the possible ways um, that a language could have evolved and emerged. Uh, one of the things I want to do is to uh, actually question a number of assumptions that we've come into it with. Uh, and those include everything from Darwinian assumptions to uh, assumptions about innateness and how brains work with respect to this process. The logic that I want to begin with is simply saying that a lot of what we tend to do, talking about a Bayesian prior, uh, is to think about uh, biology and engineering terms. We oftentimes think about the problems that we're facing in terms of components that get put together, we find the parts, we put them together, and we build complex holes from these components. And uh, it turns out that biology works in a very different way. Biology begins with relatively undifferentiated holes uh, components aren't added or put together or compounded, they differentiate out of those holes. As a biologist, I like to look at the problems that I'm facing from a biological logic, so to speak, a biological prior, if you will. One of the real problems with the engineering logic is that, in fact, when we put lots of things together, like this man uh, on the left uh, did in Los Angeles some decades ago now, where he strung a bunch of a hot air balloon, hot air, hot air balloons, but uh, helium balloons on the top of his lawn chair, thinking he would rise a little bit above the ground and uh, be able to observe his neighborhood. When he cut the tether, he went up about 20,000 feet to begin with. Um, and although he had brought along a safety device, uh, a, a BB gun that was to shoot out uh, these things and lower him down again to the ground, he was afraid to use it and drifted out over the Los Angeles airport. Uh, the problem here is there's lots of unintended consequences when you put things together. Uh, but when you differentiate from a common origin that's already functioning, uh, you have much more predictable results. And I think this is one of the reasons that biology is so successful. Now, one of the problems about language that we face is one that I ran into in my early work in the 1980s, tracing connections uh, through primate brains, trying to look at what I would pursue as homologues to language functions. In this case, we had already identified areas in which the cerebral cortex was similar to language areas in the cortex, uh, but in fact, did not know much about the connectivity. And at the time, connectivity data were fairly new, and it allowed me to sort of do these assessments. And on the left is really work from my PhD thesis back in the early 80s, in which the common color codes represent areas that are highly connected to one another. And you can see that there are some very general patterns that you can make out here in the macaque brain uh, that turned out to predict very well connectivity that we're now coming in contact with when we look at uh, human brains using some of our new techniques down here in the bottom right, uh, using DTI analysis to look at connectivity in brains. We're beginning to find that areas that we might have called Broca's area turn out to have multiple subdivisions that do not only do different things, but their connectivity is quite different. And this was information that suggested that the brains of our ancestors, quite distant ancestors, uh, in fact, uh, are organized very similar to ours, and so that language must have recruited some of these old brain systems. They're not new chunks in the brain to make this work. And this raised a secondary problem, which is when we actually now look at language functions, uh, particularly over lots of different forms of language functions, we find that a huge mass of the forebrain of humans 
um, is used for language processing at various levels, at various degrees of specificity. And here's just sort of a, a little sampling I put together. The problem is that we're dealing with the recruitment of systems that did something else in the evolutionary past. And the question that this raises is how did the synergy develop? How did all of these structures that do something very different than language come to be supporting this unique function that we have? Um, and finally, there's another tremendous mystery that I think we need to face. And that is, why is so much of language information offloaded onto social transmission? We just had a discussion of social transmission. Uh, and in fact, of course, the language evolution, cultural evolution of language, which we've just been listening to a discussion about, uh, is a very interesting phenomenon. Not only is it evolution-like, but it tells us that a huge amount of information is being passed, not genetically, but socially. And so one of the things that's happened is that a lot of information that might otherwise have been passed in, ge in the genomic way is being passed culturally. Um, and the final question I want to address, if we have time today, is uh, what are the units of language processing? Um, uh, linguistics breaks language up into familiar things like words, uh, morphemes, endings, grammatical um, operators, and sentences, and so on. The real question is, is that what's in the brain? What is in the brain that corresponds to those things? And in fact, are those kinds of chunks that we put together merge together or in, in other ways uh, to talk about how sentences get constructed? Is that the way the brain does it? Uh, it's one thing to analyze what we see on the surface as a production of a sentence, for example. It's quite another to ask uh, whether or not the brain is breaking the system up in the same way. It's the difference between a sort of a competence model which says this is what must somehow be represented in the brain as an end product versus a sort of performance level, how does the brain actually perform this process? Uh, not arguing that the analysis is wrong, but in fact that it may not be telling us much about how the brain is doing it. So let me begin uh, with the first discussion, and this is a work that was um, initiated. It's nice to be talking about it here in Japan because both uh, kinds of evidence that I'm going to bring to this question uh, really come from Japanese sources. So the first has to do with this process that's now been renamed niche construction, but it's something that we've been familiar with for a long time in evolutionary biology. Um, and that is the ability of animals to alter their environment in such a way that is in one way more available for their use, better for their reproduction or their protection and so on. Beavers building dams are a classic example of niche construction, constructing the niche that they live in. But once uh, beavers build dams, uh, they are now evolving to a niche that they've reconstructed. And that means that their bodies are not just responding to a sort of random environment, but an environment that has a kind of uh, loop of causality associated with it, uh, having to do with uh, what beavers have actually done. My analogy here is to language-like behavior, that once language-like behavior became critical to hominid life, it effectively became an artificial niche to which hominid brains had to adapt. And this is really the, basic of the basis of the argument I made uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, suggesting that human brains have evolved uh, not just to an environment and then suddenly uh, became involved in language, but in fact were involving, evolving with respect to language as a niche like the beaver dam, in effect. So let me give some examples that are uh, somewhat distant from language initially, but I think give a sense of some of the complexities of this problem in biology. And one of my favorites um, has to do with vitamin C, and one of the early ones that I had studied. Um, exactly how it is that we anthropoid primates, monkeys and apes, have come to be dependent on vitamin C. And what this little phylogeny suggests is that in fact, it's only the anthropoid primates, not even the prosimians, with one exception, uh, that need to eat vitamin C. The rest of these guys, and in fact most mammals, most animals in general, make their own ascorbic acid, make their own vitamin C by uh, modifying glucose. Uh, but we primates, all of us anthropoid primates, monkeys and apes, need to eat it. Uh, and the question is really, what happened? Why, why do we need to do it and not other species? 
Well, it turns out, and this is why I say it's nice to be in Japan, uh, that a uh, study back in 1994 by some Japanese researchers uh, studying rats and looking at the um, uh, gene that produces the final enzyme that trans transforms uh, glucose into ascorbic acid uh, identified that gene in rats. It's got a complicated name I won't pronounce here. Um, uh, sometimes called LGO or GULO, depending on how you acronym this word. Uh, and it turns out they used the rat probe to look in other species initially in humans, uh, but now it's been looked at in many other species of primates. And it turns out that we, in fact, have a pseudogene uh, that corresponds to GULO. It just is full of noise and doesn't work. In fact, it doesn't work, uh, importantly, because not only does it have stock codons hidden in it here, uh, but there's a frame shift mutation which makes everything else nonsense beyond this point. Uh, this was acquired, we think, somewhere around uh, 30 to 35 million years ago. It began to degrade. Um, so our ancestors were able to synthesize vitamin C endogenously. Um, uh, we primates uh, no longer can. And the simple scenario looks something like this. Uh, that the early primates prior to this time were mostly eating insects, uh, foraging in the trees for those insects and some gum, we think, as well, and a little bit of fruit, but not much. Uh, but as they became diurnal, that is, living and foraging in the daylight, uh, somewhere around 30 to 35 million years ago, they began to eat increasing amounts of fruit in their diet. And ascorbic acid is produced in fruit in order to preserve it against oxidative damage so that birds uh, will be able to pick it out, grab the fruit, uh, fly off, and drop the seeds somewhere later on. Uh, but you want to preserve this until just the right moment. So there's lots of vitamin C. But once you eat this regularly in the diet, uh, there's an interesting effect that I often like to call a masking effect. That is, there is now, once you have regular access to fruit, there's not strong selection to maintain uh, this gene production. And as a result, as mutations accumulate, they won't be eliminated by natural selection. Over time, as this persists over long periods of time, uh, the gene will eventually degrade, and that's what we think has happened to this last this gene, this uh, train that produces vitamin C. The problem is that when this is completely degraded, uh, now you're completely dependent upon fruit. Uh, you cannot uh, maintain yourself without this in your diet. Uh, the result is uh, that now there's a secondary process and that secondary process is that any other adaptation that you have, any other phenotypic effect that you have, that guarantees the presence of fruit on a semi-regular basis will now come under selection to maintain it. You're effectively addicted to this food source. And that means selection has now moved off of the selection for the antioxidant effects of producing ascorbic acid have been shifted onto any features of your body that will maintain this now external source it is effectively um, part of the niche out there that needs to be part of your body almost. Um, and so there's a kind of a distribution. Uh, the way I like to think of it is uh, associated, for example, with one possible change that also seems to be characteristic of uh, we anthropoid primates. That is three-color vision. We were just talking about color uh, just a few minutes ago. We anthropoid primates are the only mammals that really have the kind of color vision that we were just uh, looking at. Uh, and in fact, it, it evolves about the same time, just before uh, the two primate, major primate groups, old and new world monkeys, split. We see at least one uh, change that occurs in common. They all are the result of gene duplication, in effect. Uh, gene duplication is another example of this kind of effect of which one gene can begin to mask selection on other genes simply by virtue of its duplication. Uh, we find that the second mutations uh, that both in old and new world monkeys happened after the split. Um, I tried to simulate this and a simulation is presented down here rather than go into this since I'm running a little slow. Um, I just want to talk about what, this, what the implications of this are. Basically, developmental resources, physiological resources, or even information is provided predictably by the environment will tend to shield corresponding sources of genetic information from the purifying effects of natural selection. This means that you'll get degradation, but the degradation that follows will shift selection to any behavioral influences or other physiological influences. There's lots of interesting physiological effects because of our need for dietary vitamin C that also followed 
follow. But uh, these will be much more diverse than the original thing that was, ma was masked by this kind of effect. Uh, my hypothesis with respect to language, drawing an analogy here, is that the symbolic niche that we've constructed, the cultural niche, uh, and as well as the tool-making niche, um, effectively relax selection on a variety of innate communicative and social processes, as well as cognitive processes. And as a result, it shifted selection to features that favor the successful social transmission. In other words, what needs to be out there is if you've become dependent upon something that has been offloaded, so to speak, you now need to have a different set of adaptations to maintain uh, that uh, new niche, in this case, an artificial niche. Uh, so, in effect, it's a shift, in one sense, away from innateness uh, uh, out to a sort of a learning strategy. Uh, the second example I want to give uh, comes from uh, Kazuo Okanoya's lab and has been studying for many, many years. And when he first presented this to me, it, was, it jumped right out as another kind of example of a possible uh, case in point. And uh, I'm happy to find that in most cases, the prediction I made has, has come true. We still don't know for sure. Uh, and there's many interesting questions behind this. Uh, but the simple example that most of you are already familiar with uh, has to do with the white rum Muni and the Bengalese finch, Bengalese finch being the domesticated uh, variant. Uh, and the domesticated variant has a uh, somewhat more sonorous song, uh, has much more uh, flexibility in moving components around. Uh, and so on, and I don't have to repeat this for many of the people in this room. Whereas the uh, wild species, the various versions of the wild population animals that have been drawn in, have much more uh, stereotypic vocalizations. One of the more interesting things about this, however, is that the Bengalese finch, the domestic animal, um, spends much more of its acquisition is done by learning, uh, whereas there's much less learning going on if, if any real social learning in the white Mount Mooney. Uh, the question is how one became the other, because this is just a greed effect. Uh, and uh, here's a simple model uh, that I think will try to get this idea across, a sort of a simple um, list algorithm kind of way of talking about how, in this case, a bird that comes into the world with a strong innate bias, both a strong motor bias, perhaps, and a strong auditory template uh, to drive uh, singing behavior. Under these circumstances, you still get subsong, that is, this period of babbling-like behavior uh, just before a mature song develops. Uh, and here's what I think the way to think about it. The first thing you do is you use your uh, slight motor biases to produce an initial song that is somewhat distant from the target adult song. Um, you listen to yourself sing. Um, you compare this to your auditory template bias. Um, you then acquire some sort of difference signal from this based upon the difference what you've heard yourself sing and your auditory bias. You modify your subsong and you sing again and you cycle through this process. Uh, in this process, what will happen is um, you'll converge towards these, in a sense, innate priors in this process. The result is that you acquire a song by listening to yourself sing. This means that a deafened bird will, in effect, produce a rather abnormal song, but any bird, whether isolated or simply being able to uh, hear other birds of this same species sing, will acquire a song that really converges towards these biases. The question is, what happens when you relax selection? When you breed these animals in captivity, not for their singing, but for other traits, um, and you allow systems to degrade. You allow these innate biases, both motor biases, perhaps, and, and auditory biases to degrade. I think a very simple prediction is that the same algorithm will still be at work. Uh, but interestingly now, without these biases, what do you have to sort of drive the system? And the answer is that what you still have, if you're in a social group, is you have experience from listening to others. And really the only source of bias now is uh, what's in your auditory system. Uh, and that, is, that bias is now going to come more from a population. The result is the same algorithm will have you converge not towards these prior biases here, but historically prior biases in the population. Uh, and that is uh, what previous singers, what tutors have been producing.
The result is now that you have a short circuit. You've cut this out and you've become, in a sense, you've offloaded these innate biases onto a, a social bias that is now present in the population. What's interesting about this is that social learners um, involve many more forebrain structures, as most of you probably realize, including a variety of striatal-like structures that are involved in song learning. Whereas, uh, although they're involved somewhat less so, um, uh, quite a bit less so, in uh, those that do not do a lot of vocal learning in the same sense. Um, what we see is that in this process, um, a transition from a brain in which few forebrain structures are critically involved in song production and learning to one that many, many forebrain structures are involved, many, many connections as well. And the argument I want to make here is that this change in involvement of the forebrain in a complex structure um, does not necessarily need to be explained by a selection process, but in fact might be well explained by a relaxation of selection. Uh, in the same sense that uh, offloading uh, these effects might also occur. Um, though I won't talk about the simulation I did pick down here from Simon Kirby and Brian Ritchie. Um, uh, Simon is here in the audience can probably describe it better than I can. Uh, the basic argument I think can be depicted this way. That is if you begin to decrease uh, if the selection is maintaining, for example, sexual selection or maybe natural selection in a population of many diverse singers, many different bird species, um, maintains a strong auditory template or motor template bias. Um, in the ancestral species, once you relax this selection, it allows this bias to decline, and as a result, biases that can come from other sources can now become uh, more influential in this process. And the result is some of those biases are outside your body. They're offloaded, so to speak. Uh, the biases that were in, innate have become social, so to speak. The result is over time, uh, what's transmitted genetically uh, will effectively become much more susceptible to epigenetic influences and learning influences. And effectively, this is that offloading process. Now, I show this because I think that the analogy is interesting, not exact by a long shot, but interesting to talk about uh, human beings and why we've offloaded so much of our linguistic behavior onto social transmission. And if you think about it, there are a variety of analogs in language that look a little bit like this. That is, we've reduced the arousal coupling of our vocal behavior as a result um, shortly after birth in the first year of life, we begin to produce sounds that are relatively unconstrained in what sound follows what sound. That is, we've deconstrained that system significantly. Um, the phonological biases uh, between sound units that we produce uh, in babbling, for example, but also across languages, have become uh, much flatter in terms of their probabilities of transition from one sound to another. Um, auditory learning, of course, becomes particularly much more important. Um, uh, but also, I'm going to argue that one of the things that happens compared to, say, laughter and sobbing, which are controlled uh, quite clearly by very, very localized structures in the brain, very few uh, cerebral cortical structures play a role in this, uh, with the exception of the anterior cingulate and maybe possibly the supplementary motor cortex. Uh, our innate vocalizations, uh, like what we see in a non-learning species of bird, uh, really are quite localized in the brain, use very little, little of the forebrain. When we talk about languages I showed you in the beginning, um, we're using a tremendous amount of the forebrain uh, to produce language, and in combinations that you wouldn't expect to be involved. Uh, and my argument here is that similarly, this combinatorial effect, this shift to a kind of synergistic effect involving multiple areas might better be explained by a relaxation story than by a strong selection story. Um, the vocal rep repertoire is now determined by social transmission, and of course, um, uh, we still have uh, some of these very deep innate capacities that show up in our prosodic speech, in our emotional speech. Uh, they're still there, but they're now subordinated uh, to this cortical system. Um, so the argument I want to make here is not that selection has not been playing a role in, in human brain evolution and the evolution of language, but that there's a kind of a cycle of steps in this process. Um, 
that we're offloading uh, of some of these functions, the constructing of an artificial niche, um, relaxes selection on a variety of functions that therefore degrade. Um, this degradation um, produces new kinds of selection to maintain that niche. Uh, in this case, I think in terms of language, in maintaining uh, our ability to transmit and acquire languages. Uh, but it also creates novel synergies uh, because there's new demands. And since we've relaxed selection on one set of fairly limited systems, a whole variety of other systems can now collectively begin to contribute toward it. And this, of course, allows for this to continue around the circle. And my argument is that uh, by alternating relaxation and, and redistribution of selection again and again over time, uh, you can get something as unusual as this kind of distributed control of language. So here's a kind of very simplified three-step way of thinking about it. Relax selection, allowing many more areas to become involved as these uh, primary, simpler, innate controls begin to degrade. Other systems can play a role, but once they start playing a role and the system becomes offloaded, now there can be selection for the new synergies, for the fact that these different components begin to work together. Uh, new selection can show up in a part of, of in a sense, niche maintenance. Um, as you've already redistributed a lot of these functions, they can now begin to work together. Uh, the enlargement of the brain, I think, plays an additional role in this process because what it allows, of course, is for um, multiple roles to be played by the same structures. So the same structures can begin to play gestural functions, potentially uh, linguistic functions, and so on. Uh, I have, however, argued that there have been, and this comes from my work in the 1980s and 90s, uh, that there have been major changes of the brain, and one of the hypotheses I want to draw from this is that these quantitative changes are maybe the most important. We often try and think about uh, the changes involved in language as being somehow much more specialized. I actually um, am of the view that language or something like language has been around a long time, and that the major quantitative changes in brain structure are really the result of adaptation to this kind of niche maintenance, to acquiring and transmitting language. And so we begin, I think we need to begin to look at the large scale changes in the human brain in terms of how they might play a role in language. So for example, I think of the expansion of prefrontal cortex as being particularly important um, uh, for the combinatorial problems that language poses. Uh, I also think of it as critically important for something that was talked about earlier uh, uh, by Dr. Matsuwa, Matsuzawa about uh, the dealing with the problem of um, what, what we call stimulus equivalence, the ability to see multiple um, redistributions in, of, of, of what you might call inferences from uh, prior learning to multiple other options. Prefrontal cortex is crucial for a stimulus equivalence learning as well as for combinatorial analysis. Um, we see it ex particularly expanded. One of the other things that I think is, is quite interesting um, is that in my early work, one of the things we were trying to find out is how the uh, brainstem nucleus that controls the larynx uh, is innervated by the forebrain. And in so doing, we were doing tracer studies in a variety of species. Um, in none of the species we looked at, and we did not look at any apes, but only monkeys and, and other mammals, uh, we did not find any direct projections from cerebral cortex, motor cortex, uh, to the nucleus ambiguous, it's called, that innervates the larynx. Um, uh, however, most studies in humans have begin, begun to suggest that this is the case. We still don't have direct evidence in humans, but now lots of indirect evidence uh, that we have uh, among, alone among the mammals, a direct cortical projection uh, down to the nucleus ambiguous. Uh, one of the things that we found in our early studies was that in immature animals, there are cortical projections that make it there, but they get clipped out, they get outcompeted by other systems. Enlarging the forebrain may well allow uh, the cortex to begin to project onto this system. Again, I think of this shift onto a vocal system that is relatively rare in mammals. Uh, it's done so differently in other mammals that learn uh, their vocalizations, uh, like some of the whales, for example, uh, done so by a very different system, not by a nucleus ambiguous system. This is, a, I think, a uniquely human projection.
uh, that makes language possible, uh, speech possible, I should say. Uh, what this suggests, however, is something very, very interesting. And what it suggests is that this is an adaptation uh, specifically with respect to this linguistic capacity and that the driving up of the size of the forebrain may well have played a role in this. So now I want to move on to a second piece um, that suggests another way of thinking about language processing that's different from sort of the linguistic model uh, that we have. It again does not argue that the linguistic analysis is wrong. It simply says that we may have to think about how the brain is doing it differently than how we do so when we analyze it on paper, so to speak. Um, and this came from some work that I was doing, also tracing connections in the forebrain of monkeys and other species, looking at cortical, cortical connections, that is, connections from one area of the cortex to another. And what became clear before my work, but also along with some of the work that I was doing, um, is that there's an interesting asymmetry, and this may seem trivial at first, but I, I hope I can show you why it might be interesting. And that is, if we talk about what we call a primary and secondary area in cortex, you might say this is primary visual cortex, area 17, this might be area 18, a belt cortex around the primary visual cortex. Um, projections from the thalamus reach both of these areas. Uh, they're identified here in green. Um, uh, and what we find is that those projections always end up typically um, in a little column-like fashion in layers four and the lower parts of layer three, making these nice neat columns. Uh, what we see is that when we look at connections between cortical areas, though, they have an interesting asymmetry. The asymmetry is that the primary area, project, area projects the secondary area into a column like this, into layer three and four, similar to the way the thalamus projects. But there is a reciprocal projection that goes back, and it has a very different layered organization. It starts from cells in layer five, where this one starts from cells in layer three. And these cells in layer five project to the super, most superficial layers and the most deep layers. And they don't form columns, they form kind of sheets. So it's a very different kind of projection pattern. It was very interesting to me why this should be the case. Um, why should there be this asymmetry? Well, it turns out to be more interesting than this. Um, in fact, the layers, I won't go through this in any detail, but the layers are also broken up in terms of which areas of thalamus project into these layers. There are areas from limbic thalamic nuclei that project to the top layer, uh, and those from interlaminar nuclei of the thalamus project to the bottom layer. They also project in sheets. Whenever you see a projection to the top and the bottom, they're in these kind of sheet patterns, uh, whereas those that project into the middle from the thalamus uh, project in columns. And uh, there's an interesting asymmetry I've depicted here, layer three projecting backwards in this direction. This is from, say, a more primary to a more secondary, and this is from a secondary to a more primary. We get a different kind of projection. It's a complicated relationship. Um, what's interesting is that it's distributed across what I would call a limbic to peripheral uh, gradient, in which if you're at the periphery, the more specialized for the periphery, these areas have a projection pattern that look this way. If you're looking at projections that come from areas closer to the limbic structures of the forebrain, they project back in this kind of a pattern. But what's interesting is that this is the case across areas in the cerebral cortex. And this is what I found most surprising. Particularly surprising is this, that it didn't depend on whether I was looking at sensory systems or motor systems. Uh, and that is, they look from, irrespective of whether you know whether they're sensory and motor, the cortical cortical projections have the same kind of logic. And it's a peripherally specialized to limbic, or you might say centrally specialized to represent body needs and so on and so forth, and, and motivation and arousal. Uh, this is the case whether it's the motor system or the sensory system. And so, the way I like to think about this is that we need to stop thinking about these, as, these areas as working sort of as little black boxes with arrows that are sending functions one to another. Uh, and in fact, look at it in a quite different way, and I like to think about it in these terms. That this is a kind of morphogenic way of generating information. That is, you're starting with what might be very generalized arousal processes, and in steps, transmitting that arousal information uh, to these areas that are more specially identified with the periphery, say the uh, primary visual cortex. But the same is also happening in the motor system. 
Uh, you're generating what starts out to be sort of generalized arousal information, and it becomes, in effect, more differentiated as it moves towards the primary motor areas. But similarly, your expectation about a sensory perception becomes more differentiated as you move from uh, generalized arousal to highly specialized areas. And I want to talk about this sort of gradient of effects um, a little bit with respect to language as well. So the first thing I want to point out is that it raises a very interesting question in terms of the way the cortex generally processes information. And that is that the sensory system from a cortical cortical way of thinking about it is processing information like the motor system. And the motor system is doing something like the sensory system. And it, it forces you to ask the question, in what way is the motor system like a sensory system and a sensory system like a motor system? And so here's this sort of general logic. Um, and I came up with these names in the early 90s, and nobody liked these names, and they're not remembered. And I think it's mostly because they're hard to, to, to say separately without getting confused. A centripetal and centrifugal, those of you who've had basic uh, physics courses know that these are talking about the forces uh, that hold uh, swinging, uh, if you swing a rock around or, or your or your yo-yo around your head, the centripetal forces hold it in. The centrifugal forces are pulling it out. Um, so I like to think about centrifugal as the processes as they move out from limbic-like areas to peripherally specialized areas, and the centripetal processes as they come in from specialized areas and they develop in stages towards these limbic areas. The question is, why do they both? Why do they superimpose on each other? And the way I like to think about it uh, can go back to this image here. And that is basically, I see that very generalized processes become differentiated as they move in this direction. And those differentiation processes are in effect coming in context with an environment. That environment comes from the outside. It comes from either what you're perceiving, that is selecting on what you're generating and anticipating step by step, um, or, in fact, it comes from previous muscle movements uh, that tell you what the next muscle movement can be in this series. And what I show you here is there's also, I don't show this with the sensory system, but kind of a hierarchy of how they project. All of these areas receive thalamic projections and have projections that leave the cerebral cortex into subcortical areas. Um, so this is a sort of parallel processing model that I want to drive home. Now, my analogy for this is also a biological analogy. And it's this one. It's what's called countercurrent diffusion. Um, those of you who've taken a physiology class may be familiar with this. Um, there's basically what we call two diffusion strategies um, if you have moving fluids. One is you can move fluids through two, two pipes here, and there is a diffusion where they are in contact. Um, think of this as heat, for example. Uh, you give up heat as you move along here. This one picks up heat, and you can see the change here. Um, if this was just a passive system in which you had a cold container up here and a, and a hot container down here, eventually this would converge towards equilibrium uh, so that they were equally, um, equally uh, hot or equally cold. What's interesting is that by sending liquids through these pipes in opposite directions, um, you can actually push this system well beyond equilibrium. Uh, and to try to make this analogy clear, what's happening here is that as this hot fluid comes in here, it's meeting fluid that's been heated up progressively stage by stage by stage as it comes in contact with it. So that by the time this leaves, it has absorbed almost all the heat. And there's still a gradient here, where at this point, the gradient is reducing, and you can see that in terms of these arrows. The gradient reduces, and you are becoming less and less efficient. Here, it's equally efficient across the entire domain. And that means by sending things in opposite directions, you can drive a system to a point at which they're almost entirely matched, uh, well beyond equilibrium. So hopefully you're getting the sense of this being a sort of driver also that might be relevant 
for the biological processing of information in cerebral cortex. Um, this strategy is used in gills, fish gills, where blood goes in one direction and water goes in the opposite direction. Why? Because fish have to take as much oxygen out of the water as they possibly can. Um, it's used in your kidneys. Uh, it's used to cool legs of, of aquatic birds. And of course, we use it in all kinds of heat exchangers, including nuclear reactors, because we have to draw as much heat out as we can, as fast as we can. So how does this affect our thinking about language? Well, the engineering models basically are compositional models, whether they are algorithm, uh, algorithmic models that talk about um, how we analyze sentences into components and phrases and so on, phrase structure rules, or whether we're using a kind of a merge-like logic in which um, the components uh, naturally tend to fit together and constrain each other in the way they interact. There's lots of ways of doing this constraining model, but here's my sort of cartoon way of showing it, uh, in which you don't need a lot of algorithms to stick these together because they can only stick together in a few ways. They can only merge, but basically it's an argument about putting pieces together. What I want to suggest is that if you look at this another way, and you look at um, the structure of uh, an utterance like a sentence in terms of nested values, in which each of these is sort of dependent on each other, the tree can be redrawn as a Venn diagram here. You can also think about it as degrees of differentiation, where these smaller chunks are more differentiated than the larger ones here. And so what I want to talk about is that maybe one way to rethink the way that brains process language, uh, the way that old structures doing the way that, that brains have always done this, uh, work is that in effect uh, different areas are dealing with differently differentiated aspects of language structure. Um, those that are closer to limbic functions or prefrontal functions or some of the more middle temporal functions, uh, not dealing with language per se as we normally understand it, but prolonged processes maintaining a trace so that as I'm sending, saying each of these sentences, I am maintaining information well before I've actually produced and what I would say differentiated the words and the sentences that come out. There has to be something that maintains that trace over a long period of time, but is relatively undifferentiated in its detail. At the same time, and in parallel to that, a lot of these details have to be generated. So here I try to demonstrate this with a kind of color-coded feature where these rapidly changing processes here are differentiating within a fairly stable process. So that what we see is that over time, um, in effect, what I'm claiming here is that one way to think about how the brain might be processing language is that words and phonemes are a very late stage in a process of differentiation, not something that pre-exists and gets put together in chunks. Um, this doesn't necessarily, as I say, contradict linguistic models, but it does give you a different way of thinking about how we might model them neurologically. Uh, one of the other interesting predictions of this is that connectivity over the long range that is, the differentiation of things in the auditory pathways, visual pathways, and the motor pathways actually have some interesting features to them. That is, those areas that are most involved in what I would call late stage differentiation do not have connections front to back. Although it was thought originally by Carl Wernicke that there was a direct connection between so-called Wernicke's area and Broca's area, that does not turn out to exist. Um, what we do see, however, is that some of the higher association areas, so-called, are connected across. And what this says is that there's probably parallel co coordinated and correlated differentiation of both of these at early stages, but not at late stages, suggesting that there may be modularity functions down here. These are functioning in isolation of each other, whereas some of the higher order functions are going to be non-modular. Uh, and another way of thinking about how the anatomy might tell us something here. So what are, what's my hypothesis from this? Is that the basic linguistic unit of utterance um, is, in effect, probably not assembled from small parts, although we have the mnemonics of those small parts uh, represented in sort of those more distal areas. Um, that, in fact, uh, it's differentiated. The process is one in which the parts of speech are progressively differentiated from more abstract sensory motor orientation processes. And that these are temporally nested. That is, some things are maintained for a long period of time uh, throughout our speech process, and others are differentiating out uh, in this way I just described. 
Well, let me end uh, with some really far-flung ideas. Um, and this has to do with what I call semiotic constraints. And one of the assumptions is that the regularities in language uh, ultimately have to be somehow evolved. Uh, that is, the features are so diverse, the possibilities are so many, uh, that there really needs to be a process that really winnows these down, whether it's evolution or some kind of um, sudden event in our, in our previous evolution that created a template that language just has to fall into. Uh, I think about it thinking in terms of converging constraints, we can begin to compound all the various kinds of constraints that might, in fact, make this domain in which language has to be learned, that is what you might call realizable languages, um, or evolvable languages, might be a fairly small domain. It's contained within a whole variety of subdomains having to do with, for example, what we have to do to automate language, what has to be the case in order to do it without thinking for the most part, um, what, how discourse constraints may sort of limit what you can do and bias how it will be developed, um, computational consistency, that is, regularities that have to show up to make it more automatable, and so on. I want to talk about just one of these, what I call semiotic constraints, because I think they've been least attended to uh, in the literature, certainly in linguistics. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that a well-formed proposition, uh, that sentences in general have something interesting about them that we've recognized as universal across languages. They have a kind of dyadic structure. You can't have just one kind of word, so to speak. You need something that corresponds to a subject or a verb, a predicate, an argument, a topic, a comment, and so on. That is, different, two different kinds, at least, of, of operational units in language. And if they're not there, they have to be prefigured in the context, for example, um, as in they are in, in sort of sudden utterances like fire and so on. Um, the grammatical roles, I don't think, and most people would argue, don't obviously correspond to interesting agents and patient action object, where and what roles, although in certain cases they are more or less like this. Um, what I want to argue is that, in effect, uh, these things are quite ubiquitous for another reason, and that they may underlie this grammatical requirement. Um, my comparison, my analogy, is to prime numbers in, in mathematics. Prime numbers uh, are discovered. Uh, once you develop subtraction, and then you figure out that you can iterate subtraction, there are going to be exceptions to the problem of iterative subtraction, and those are the prime numbers. No matter whether we discover it on Earth or somebody discovers it on some planet elsewhere in the galaxy, they will discover prime numbers. Um, my argument here is that linguistically this dyadic structure may have to do with what I call the constraints on indexicality. Um, we heard a lot about indexicality dem demonstratives and DXs this morning, and I want to just play on this a little by talking about different kinds of indices, in part because indexicality is really the rule in most animal communication. Uh, symptoms, uh, calls, do flaps here, and so on, um, pointing obviously a highly specialized variant of it that shows up in human beings. Um, but samples are also indices in this sense. What I want to argue is that, in fact, the constraints on indexicality tell us some interesting things about syntax and grammar. Uh, and I'm just going to pick one of these features. Um, and I'm going to argue that immediacy is crucial. To index something, it has to be in a part-whole kind of relationship, an immediacy, temporal immediacy, expectation immediacy, uh, or physical immediacy, like pointing to something physically or pointing to something at a distance. Um, what I want to say in language, uh, we have similar constraints, and I think they're inherited uh, by our grammars. Uh, uh, let me just skip past this piece here and just talk about the problem of symbolic reference. Words don't refer to things. Names refer to things. Words refer, basically, as we all know, to some point, however you want to conceive of it, in a what you might call a lexical network, a network of meanings or references or, or, or concepts, so to speak. Um, as a result, they don't actually refer to things in the world unless they're names. Uh, and this has given rise to this notion that arbitrary reference is the basis of language. Um, what happens, however, is that um, we can take these abstract relationships, 
that point to a position in an abstract network and link them to things in the world um, by virtue of indices. And when I say we do this quite simply, one of the ways I can do it is I can, I can point to this being hard. Um, hard by itself doesn't accomplish anything, but if I do this or point and say hard, the combination of that symbol, which refers to an abstract position, so to speak, and the index coexisting together in time now allows me to refer to something with this abstraction. Uh, we do so also with demonstratives and terms like that and this and so on. Uh, what I want to say is that these two components are what occurs in language that requires these two components, what I would call the dyadic components. And so let me just quickly say that once you pull this apart, you lose uh, symbolic reference. Uh, so I'm going to skip this guy if I can get past it. There are all kinds of linguistic examples that I want to talk about. If this wasn't supposed to happen this way, sorry. Um, uh, what I want to argue here to close is that um, one of the constraints that might drive grammars in this way is that if you lose the connection between an index and its symbolic component, um, you lose the referential capacity. That is, if you lose referential capacity, then one of the things that's going to happen is you're simply not going to know what's being talked about. Um, this means you're not going to be able to communicate it um, or you're not going to be able to understand it. My argument here is that this minimal dyadic feature that corresponds to effectively all languages um, may be the result of this simple process. So let me just end with this. That my argument here is that it may give us a different way to think about language acquisition. Um, if there are more semiotic constraints like this than I think there are, in fact, it means that acquiring knowledge of these grammatical constraints is not like learning rules, nor is it like mapping to an innate model. Um, young children are going to make good guesses for referential reasons. Um, and not only that, they'll be able to tap their knowledge of reference already. Children begin well before language understanding indexicality. And we have a huge evolutionary background in understanding indexicality. Um, we have predispositions to point and understand that that we've heard about today as well uh, that make it so that this is a strong predisposition for humans. And what I want to say is that ultimately this radically reduces the domain of what I would call referentially useful grammars. That is, the domain is quite small and children will discover these rules. They won't induce them. Uh, they'll discover them by virtue not of knowing rules and exceptions, but of failure of reference. And so let me just end since I'm now way over time. Uh, and oh, I was afraid that it would happen. Um, uh, I'm sorry about this. This is one of these loops. <clears throat> so the, basically what I'm saying is that we need to begin to open our mind to all of the possible sources uh, of language regularity. We need to rethink the way language is processed. And to understand language evolution, all of these are important. Multiple levels interacting together, uh, producing a very complex, nonlinear kind of relationship um, that I think uh, we have a lot to learn about. And I'm so impressed by how much we've done so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Um, I think that, in fact, studying domesticated animals will tell us a lot about ourselves. We're already beginning to understand that our genome uh, looks like a domesticated genome with lots of pseudogenes and so on showing up uh, compared to chimpanzees. I like to think of us as a genetically degraded chimpanzee in that respect. Um, but what that means is we've offloaded a great deal. Uh, but that also explains a lot of the variability we find in human societies, not just language, um, but even the control of reproduction, which is one of those areas in evolution that's generally the most tightly controlled. Um, we've offloaded a lot of that to cultural processes and which we can find marital practices and child-rearing practices of incredible variety uh, in human societies. I think that the variability of human societies actually attests to this kind of self-domestication that's gone on. I think one of the other things that happens with this is that a de-differentiated organism, that is, has lost some genetic differentiation, um, will look a lot more like a younger animal. It's a what I call pseudo-neoteny. That is, once you lose differentiation, you look like an animal that's not differentiated as much. And in fact, one of the things that's been characteristically commented about our own species is that we look very much like a neotenous ape. Um, Thanks very much. That was very, very interesting and deep. So, uh, mentioning you were mentioning constraints on logic and on indexicality. So, I would, I would like to hear your thoughts about what is what, what do you think is going on on the side of the incredible flexibility of use of articulators that we seem to have. We can point with pens and lasers. Actually, you were doing an amazing job pointing with the mouse. I think the first speaker probably realizing that you can actually point on the body screen. So therefore, you come up with something opportunistically very, you know. So we seem to be incredibly flexible in terms of what parts of the body we use, which would, in terms of motor action and cortical control and so on, would differ tremendously depending on what you're using. Now, on the side of the referent, uh, we seem to be also incredibly flexible to ascribe meaning to what we're referring to. So we could say here, and then here could be, we have all kinds of scales, the same thing applies for now, could be now in different time scales, and so on. This many second, this day, this year, this millennium, and so on. So what are your thoughts in terms of the constraining the physicality, but playing at the same time with this incredible amount of degrees of freedom that we have uh, at our disposal, that we seem to manage in a minute, maybe seconds. So what are your thoughts there? Thank you. Well, let me start with the neurology. Um, I do think that a lot of our capacity has to do with our enormously overdeveloped, what I would say, prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex, as I mentioned before, plays a significant role in combinatorial analysis um, and in suppression processes as well. Um, it does also play a crucial role, I think, in orienting. One of the early studies that I was interested in studying prefrontal cortex in terms of its connections is what kind of a map that system has. When you actually look at where other areas project forward, areas in the visual or auditory or somatic areas all have distinctive maps that correspond to the body. When you look at their connections in the prefrontal cortex, they, they, the map gets jumbled. And it was a mystery what kind of a map it was. Um, in the tracer studies I was doing, I began, I began looking for where else in the brain connected to prefrontal cortex has a map that's the same as the prefrontal cortex, that doesn't get jumbled. It turns out it was the deep superior colliculus of all places. The superior colliculus is used for orienting. It's not a map of any sensory process, but it's a map of where you're orienting. Um, and it turns out, work by Patricia Goldman Rakish, uh, now a generation ago, showed that damaging regions of the prefrontal cortex does something interesting. It blocks your ability to inhibit spontaneous orienting in a certain direction. So if you're told not to look over here, but a bright light shines over here, suddenly flashes, your eyes will tend to spontaneously go there. That's your superior colliculus at work. Um, if your prefrontal cortex is working well and you're trying to resist that, you can. But a damage in a particular position in prefrontal cortex that corresponds to that position off of what I'm attending to um, actually will allow you so you can't inhibit that behavior. So I think the prefrontal cortex is playing a crucial role and it's one of the areas that's, I think, most um, altered in human brains. And my guess is that a big part of it has to do with our indexicality. <laughs> 
So there's a lot of other pieces to it, but I've gone on too long with that.